much for doing this. Um, I'm really excited to have you on. Um, yeah. And I was just going to say, it'd be great maybe if we just kick off if you just introduce yourself and who you are. Yeah, so um, I'm Jackie Cooper. I am the CEO of the Blockchain Legal Institute and also otherwise known as Crypto Mom 2. <laughs> you have to tell me why you're known as Crypto Mom. Where does that come from? So um, not so long a story, but there might be a longer story as I start to tell it. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a mom and um, I have a, a wonderful uh, daughter who's now 27 and doing great things. Um, but when I first started my blockchain journey, which was about um, eight years ago, someone said, oh, you're a crypto mom. And I said, no, I really have to be crypto mom too, because Hester Pierce is crypto mom one, the first one, because the media dubbed her as that. And I really did not want to um, step on her toes. <laughs> so <laughs> well, I didn't realize that that's what she'd been dubbed. That's that's cool. Oh, well, you're, you're following her blazed trail then. That's wonderful. Exactly. She, she broke a lot of glass ceilings. And um, so, you know, and being a, 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 you know, a spokesperson for those within the blockchain space. So, um, I'm sort of doing the similar thing in terms of, you know, promoting, educating and making sure people have resources so that way they can make the decision about what's best for their journey. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, can you talk a bit about your journey then? Because you have a background in law. So what's your career journey been and when did you first find out about this groundbreaking technology? <laughs> Yeah, so I um, I started um, learning about the blockchain world about eight years ago now, and my first step into this was um, with some difficulty because I realized that even though I have a lot of education, it wasn't intuitive to me. So I needed some mentoring and help, and I found a woman in Scotland who actually had been in this space for a while, and she answered my questions uh, in a very um, thorough way, so I felt comfortable with um, the information she was sharing, and she showed me how to open up my first wallet. I ended up, um, I, I am a Bitcoin miner and a node owner now, so I've taken you know the step from the first wallet opening to now the tech side, um, but my first token that I bought was an altcoin, and in some ways, I'm very happy that that was my first experience because it had an ecosystem. So I could see how it could be used to buy air or food or other objects. And as opposed to buying a token or a coin on a centralized exchange, I really saw the possibilities of what cryptocurrency could be as a currency. And when I learned about Bitcoin and and the the, the power of that decentralized um, currency, I realized, the, you know, the the economic freedom that it could provide to people. So, you know, again, I've had a long um, journey myself in terms of understanding the liquidity behind things, the risks behind things, and um, it's been very positive. But I've 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 been scammed too. I've had situations too. So, you know, um, it and through those lessons, I've been able to help others to kind of learn how to ask questions to be able to be um, more astute as we kind of make these financial investment decisions. Yeah, that makes sense. How did you end up starting the Blockchain Legal Institute? Is it, and is its jurisdiction, is it US wide? Is it global? Like what's the kind of geographical area that you're looking to cover with it? Yeah, no, it is global. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, for people who um, want to see it, we might share screen later, but Basically, the Blockchain Legal Institute got started in May of 2023 because I wrote, I'm, I'm the author of a series of books called The Bitcoin Cinderella. And The Bitcoin Cinderella and the Seven Dwarves was um, sponsored by CleanSpark and um, at the Miami conference, Bitcoin conference, so that way I could give it away. When I was at the my booth giving it away, a young attorney came up to me and asked me for help and resources so she could start her legal practice in that area. And I realized there wasn't a centralized location for all these resources because we're in a decentralized space. So um, so I, I with um, my co-founder, who's more on the tech side, I'm on the content side, um, did a two-month hackathon. And in July, the Blockchain Legal Institute 
got kicked off and it's designed not just for lawyers. Um, I mean, CPAs can be on there um, and women, men, individuals, students, um, all age groups. It's a resource for what's going on within news, artificial intelligence, Bitcoin, Ethereum, blockchain use cases, laws from the 50 states, laws from around the world, um, various associations. Um, it really is a library. I mean, think of it as um, uh, it's only five months old, but it's rich with information from videos to publications, and um, it will become like the next Wikipedia blockchain. I mean, the the support that I've been getting to provide resources behind it is really exciting. And it's it's to save people time sometimes too, because again, you don't always know where to go for resources. And there's such a diverse quality of resources out there. So there's like, um, there are some very great content resources, but then there are opinion oriented resources. And you, like everything else, you have to look at, you know, is it a primary source? It's just like when you went to a library many years ago, if you walk in the door and you see the books on the shelves, you know, is it the Constitution of the United States or is it someone writing about the 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 various things that were written in the Constitution? You have to kind of think, OK, what who it is and what are they talking about? And then you have to judge it, decipher it and see how does this apply to your life? Interesting. Who contributes to it? Like, how do you maintain the database and keep it current? So um, great question. And there's um, there are uploads almost daily. Uh, we have a number of contributors from around the world who and, and new individuals from interns to actual professionals who are contributing and businesses as well. Um, I have um, over the last eight years um and, and I tell the story. So if someone's also hearing the interview from, you know, about, a, I have a spam email and uh, I call it spam. It's really not. It's wherever I sign up for a newsletter because I only want that to hit one email. And so for the, the years that I've been doing my own personal research, I have a ton of information and the Blockchain Legal Institute really is like the umbrella, you know, so I have different hubs of newsletters and resources, but the Library of Congress is one of the resources that, you know, I, I get information from. I get information from the um, the UN, you know, major organizations down to businesses that are shilling for themselves, but still have good content. And so you have to kind of discern uh, to, to major news feeds to um, agencies. So um, I am uh, sometimes the the choice of when to post it depends upon um, the current events is happening so fast. So sometimes I choose to kind of sit and wait and see what the fallout is before I post. Um, but sometimes I'm posting currently. So it really depends. Um, and the laws in different countries, we have different partners in different parts of the world that are also contributing to the pages because uh, things have, have changed a lot and, and on the yeah. ground changing. So. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a real moving target, actually. It, it's interesting because <laughs> you've got <laughs> it's interesting because you've got a really broad insight then into into what legislation looks like around the world. And you're obviously based in the US, but what's your sense of of like the legislative landscape globally? Like, which regions do you think are doing really well in supporting and encouraging innovation within a good regulatory framework, and which ones do you think are lagging more? So um, India is really growing right now, even though there's been some challenges within, you know, the um, the country in terms of their view of cryptocurrency in use. But there's been a lot of conversations and development, and they, as a tech country, are really training a lot of developers. So as a result of that, um, their government and th those that are around it are really looking at how do we frame the conversation to be supportive of business. Um, you know, we have um, uh, Bermuda, which is a sandbox into itself that I visited um, and I'm writing a book for them uh, that will help uh, talk about what they're doing. But, you know, you have the EU, which just passed the, um, the, the regulations dealing with artificial intelligence and a lot of other uh, digital assets. And, you know, that impacts a huge number of countries. And then um, 
the question is, and and actually not just their countries, but also the global, because anyone who does business within is going to have to be aware of the privacy issues and um, the cookies and, you know, just if they are a certain size, they have certain obligations, if they are not. So the the lawyers that are um, navigating this and the advisors um, really have to stay on top of it. I know that the Nordic uh, community actually, you know, we're one of our partners is the Nordic Blockchain Association. And in learning more about those uh, that community, they they had a lot of foresight even way before the EU. You know, there were a lot of countries that were doing things um, and, and even putting information on the blockchain um, with the idea of privacy and individual rights. So um, there's like these pockets of uh, communities that even here in the United States, you know, that are looking at and that are more progressive than others. And I'm not saying progressive like liberal or conservative, I'm saying in terms of technology progressive to try to figure out how to um, stay ahead, but in alignment with what the technology is doing. Um, you know, overseas and in Asia, I mean, you, you definitely have Singapore and some of those areas, but you, you know, there are things that are going on in Korea and Vietnam. I mean, there's, as the business community develops, Australia, I mean, you know, I'm just thinking about how forward they were in terms of um, creating laws way before others. Um, you know, so I think, I think it really depends upon the market, the business market to say, okay, this makes, we can make, it's always driven by money. We can make money from this. So we need the laws that will support this. Um, and in the United States, which is where I'm based, we have lobbyists on either side. So really it's just whoever has the strongest voice at the time that might um, end up uh, creating the legislation, whether or not I agree with it, it's a whole nother story. But in, so I believe in protecting consumers, but I also believe in allowing the freedom of choice for the entrepreneurs um, to succeed or fail because even traditional businesses, startups fail and um, you can invest in a startup, but it doesn't mean it's a scam. So, you know, again, there's a different mindset, I think, when it comes to cryptocurrency and all those other businesses within the blockchain, just because of the media hype. So I think that kind of um, creates a different tone that yeah. people should be looking at every business the same way. It, it just happens that it's on an innovative technology platform as opposed to the content or service. So... Yeah, yeah, that definitely makes sense. How do you think the US is faring? Because we're actually having this conversation a day after the ETFs actually started trading. And there was a big fanfare about it. And it's funny, because I'm based in Canada, and Canada's had a Bitcoin ETF since February 2021. Um, and I fully accept that the population is much smaller here, obviously, and I think US is nearly 10 times the size. But it's just interesting to me that there was so much fanfare about it for the US and so many expectations and the build up was just going on forever. Um, and I think a lot of people didn't even realize that Canada had already had an ETF for like three years. And, and it just wasn't that momentous, I don't think. It was just like, whatever. I mean, people were happy that it was brought out, but it didn't materially, I don't think, change you know the, the Bitcoin landscape that much in certainly north of the US. Um, so what do you think about the ETF approval and what its impact might be? And where do you think the US is on in this kind of journey from a regulatory standpoint? So I'm I'm glad that products are approved. I think that some of our agencies in the US overstep what they should be doing. So, uh, so I'm glad that that happened. I think, again, um, our media in, in the US um, is, is always focused on controversy. So if they think that there's controversy going on, whether it's um, financial or, or, or violence, let's put it that way, they're gonna play on it to get ratings. And, um, and that's, that's, not, that's not a good 
news model to have. I think that um, you know we we need to be changing the the tone of how we report, and and years ago it was more factual. Now it's more opinions. So even on the talk shows, it's more opinions. It's not like the news of the day. It's more news opinions of the day, editorial. But we've gotten um, away from facts. And I think that that's the problem. And that's why I think the hype happened because they, and also I think it's education. People don't understand the nature of Bitcoin. They don't understand the, and that also comes back down to the agencies. Again, there's multiple definitions as to what a token is or what a cryptocurrency is. And so because of that a controversy and, and um, confusion, it creates a different type of hype. And, um, you know, Bitcoin is very utilitarian. It's, you know, it can be used in so many different ways. Being a Bitcoin miner, you know, I appreciate the value of it, but it's like real estate. It goes up and down. And But if you were to go, when I, if I was to go to Canada and exchange my dollar for, a, you know, a different foreign currency, there's ups and downs in my foreign exchange trade there. When I go from the airport, you know, and I find, okay, my dollar is only worth this value. Well, that's no different than a cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. It's only worth the value depending upon the day in the market. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the fact that people weren't bringing up the Canadian ETF is a shame. I think that they should have started that conversation because, I, you know, again, there's a lot of pr progress in other countries that are using these products. And um, people need to know that this is not a new thing. It's uh, It's been around. And... Um, there's uh there's a history for it yeah it's interesting i mean i i do i mean i'm very much of the not your keys not your coin school so i would strongly discourage people from putting money into an etf if you have the option of buying bitcoin directly and cold storing it and self custodying it so that i think would be the best option but i can also see that you know if you've got like a roth ira or something like that and you want to have exposure to bitcoin it's a it's a great vehicle for doing that so it it does have some good practical applications as well and um, what I would like, you sorry go ahead i was going to say i like the option though of the bitcoin because i know in my own personal journey in retirement um when i first started investing in an ira I didn't have access. I didn't have the ability to say, consider an altcoin, consider Bitcoin, consider something that for me is not risky, but for my financial advisor, might they might think, okay, it's risky. I, I didn't have those options. So the fact that I agree with you, I like being a miner versus, you know, going through a third party. But if, if people at least have that ability, then they can choose. And right now we haven't had the choice in the past. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. What would you like to see happen from a regulatory perspective then when you look across the globe at some of the regions that are doing a really good job of it? Like what kind of regulatory frameworks or legal frameworks do you think are conducive to supporting innovation while protecting consumers and making sure that things are done in the right way? Do you have any thoughts about specific rules that you really like? Yeah, um, I think that we need to be looking at more of the economic uh, the economic zone model, the sandbox model to have uh, companies uh, be encouraged to experiment um, in a professional business way. Uh, and also for the consumers, the KYC, you know your customer, I think is really important um, because then they the company knows who they are and where they are. But I I don't think, and I know that this idea was floated around and I'm not a fan of it. Um, I don't think that this type of investment should be restricted or relegated just to accredited investors. I think that, um, you know, that really frightens me if, if people are saying, well, someone who doesn't have a certain income level should not have access to this. Mm -hmm. I, I think we all need to have the, the ability to choose, experiment, fail and succeed. And um, the only way that you learn how to invest is by losing money. Um, obviously, you don't want to um, put a lot in, but if you're just learning something, it's like riding a bike, you're going to fall down a few times and then you learn, okay, don't do it this way. You know, I didn't look at the candles, right? I didn't do this. You know, again, there's, there's always tech vocabulary 
and skills. And yes, there are certain platforms when you're trading or learning that are play, but sometimes you, what's on the computer play platform is not the real life market. So, and sometimes it is, but the thing is that you, um, I, I'm more about, maybe I'm, maybe I'm more libertarian. Maybe I think that people need to have the freedom to, to choose an experiment, um, within the wisdom of the fact that there could be loss. Um, I am concerned that sometimes the public is not savvy and they rush into things in America. And I'm a lawyer, I'm an educator, but sometimes we rush too fast to the lawsuit side simply because we um, made a mistake ourselves. So, um, I mean, if we don't know how to ask the questions, now, granted, someone can be scamming you too, but if we don't know how to ask the questions and we make a mistake, then it might be on us and not on the platform. So there's a lot of factors here. Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think that the, when you sort of delve into this world, that kind of self-sovereign uh, training comes into play where a lot of the focus is on making sure that you can be self-sovereign and that you're sort of responsible for your own finances. And I think um, it was interesting, actually, because I was interviewing somebody this morning uh, for the podcast, just, uh, you know, we were talking about the, she's a death doula, but we were talking about, you know, like, kind of confronting death and thinking about how you manage your life and we were just sort of saying about how everything gets so outsourced these days so there are all these kind of guardrails put around things and what happens is people just stop understanding stuff or stop learning um because they're not self-sufficient and they're constantly outsourcing so it, it's interesting I think the bit the impact for certainly I think many people that get into the Bitcoin space when you start understanding that self-sovereign nature of the money and the self-custody it really changes your relationship uh, to a lot of things not just not just Bitcoin so it, it's quite um, fascinating. I'm glad you brought or I'm, inter I'm interested to hear more about the the person that you interviewed but from the perspective of um, uh, your family and situations that can happen because I'm a single mom and also a lawyer, one of my pet passion areas is making sure everyone has a will and making sure that the family knows how to access your coins. Your, you know, I know everyone is concerned about privacy and everything, but if we are creating generational wealth online and your family doesn't know, then you've defeated the purpose because if something happens to you medically or otherwise, and they don't know how to access it, which it's, uh, you know, it can be difficult to, because it might be on your phone, it might be on the computer, it might be authenticated through an email, you know, there's just different ways. Um, I, I think that this is something that everyone who owns a digital asset needs to immediately take ownership of, um, of talking to the family about, okay, these are our assets. This is how we, um, you know, access it. It's no different than knowing who your mortgage company is or who your healthcare provider is, you know, again, and even making sure your accountant and your lawyer um, have that information, maybe not your seed words, but know where they are. So in case something has to happen, especially if you have minor kids, I mean, I created um, another, I mean, I pop everything on Amazon, but I created a, you know, a best five minute crypto wealth organizer for my daughter, who's now 27, but when she was younger, I wanted her to know how to do this, you know, again, because we, um, we need to teach others and, and the best way of financially knowing how to um, take uh, charge of your own life is also knowing where your paperwork is, mm -hmm. even though I'm a procrastinator in many ways, um, you know, this type of, you know, like, doing my taxes and having a box of receipts and then organizing them at the end of the year. This, these are critically important documents that everyone I think needs to have. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit then and talk about your uh, fiction books, because that's a really interesting area that you've delved into and it's quite opposite to your work as a lawyer um, and all of this kind of very formal stuff. Can you can you sort of touch on how you got into writing and uh, and then yeah. writing about Bitcoin? Yeah, or so, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, no, it is, it's Bitcoin. Um, so I wrote the books, it's a series called The Bitcoin Cinderella and the right now the second book is called The Bitcoin Cinderella and the Seven Dwarves. And there are two more books coming out. The uh, it is like Harry Potter and the blockchain. 
it's the Bitcoin Cinderella and the Pink Sands Treasure of Bermuda. And then um, the Bitcoin Cinderella and the True Stories of Women in Bitcoin, which we still need to schedule your interview. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, being in the education space and the law space, it kind of provided me two different pathways of, of looking at things and also being a mom. I realized that kids were gaming, like my daughter. I knew nothing about gaming until she started doing stuff. And I was investing and she knew nothing about that. And there wasn't that cross communication. So I, and then in the education space, I saw that there were a lot of tech things, but nothing that was kind of an, a gentle way to enter this area. So I um, decided to use the power of storytelling through the Cinderella story. And so the first story, um, Bitcoin Cinderella, the mom is actually a blockchain engineer and uh, who works with Satoshi, who is the, the actual creator of Bitcoin. And the dad is a traditional banker. So there's a little bit of a clash there because they have different philosophy of life. And um, Cinderella ends up, um, the mom leaves to go into the metaverse, which um, she leaves a note for her daughter though, saying, I'm gonna see you again. And these are, this is how you're going to find me. And she leaves her a purse, which has like words in it and numbers. And Cinderella had no clue what it is. And so over the journey of the first story, she learns that that's actually a Bitcoin wallet. Those are seed words. And um, so in the traditional adventure, there's a, um, a ball. And so the ball happens in the metaverse for the prince, who's more new ages. The queen and king have it in their palace. And she gets kicked out of the metaverse with a timed NFT. So um, a lot of the vocabulary is um, built within. And also, I always say this in the book as well. Don't give your seed words out to anyone. But in the book, the prince has six seed words and she has six. And yes, I'm going to ruin the story for you guys. But anyway, the glass slipper instead of the glass slippers that the wallet comes together. And when the seed words are put together and then it opens up. So that way they know that they're supposed to be. So, but there's a lot of other, you know, magical things. So definitely, you know, have fun with the story. Um, and then she, the, she and the prince decide that they want to heat their new castle with Bitcoin and power it with solar. So they had to learn more about Bitcoin and she's still on this adventure over the series to find her mom, which she will probably by the 10th book. But so she hops through the magic mirror and visits her cousin, Cinder, uh, Snow White, who's in El Salvador. And El Salvador is definitely you know a country that has adopted bitcoin as a currency so um that she learns about hard forks soft forks the whole history of bitcoin lightning which is a second layer protocol for those that might not know and so there's um i did all this research and i was learning even though i'm minor i really had any clue about all this so it was fascinating to me so each book is um there's always QR codes to take you back to the online portals for more education and each book has a different topic. So there's going to be, she's going to hop from one country to the other, learning about different things. There'll be a topic about the DAOs. There'll be a topic about, you know, what, what other Web3 concepts, blockchain uses, um, digital world assets, everything that is happening in our online physical, hybrid physical space, she's going to be exploring in a way that makes, through fairy tale, but tech also so it's, I guess it's a new genre. Instead of historical fiction, it's historical tech. <laughs> I don't know. But um, it's a fun write and hopefully a fun read for everyone to have a conversation to start the journey of exploring. That's so fascinating. Did you have any experience in writing books before you started? Uh, yes, not formally. I mean, I... Um, I was right. I'm, I do write blogs and um, my happiness uh, news factor blog. I, this last one that I wrote, I, I realized as I was writing, I tagged myself as an intuitive writer. So I really, the Bitcoin Cinderella book was a very easy write. I mean, uh, when the idea came to me, which was about three years ago, um, when I say an easy write, it wasn't like one day, it took a, a few weeks. But, you know, again, the characters spoke. It, it was an easy flow. Now the Bitcoin Cinderella and the seven dwarves was a whole different matter because I, I knew I was using the Snow White theme and because I had to do the tech research, I sort of knew that each of the dwarves was going to be a different name because they're mining Bitcoin. So instead of mining gold, they're mining Bitcoin. 
but I really didn't want it to be a tech book. So that really was like, um, it's pulling teeth, <laughs> but it was, it was, you know, that was more like a three month, you know, long to, cause I had to go back over. I had to make, you know, so hopefully people, you know, are going to enjoy the read on that, but it's fun. And then the next one uh, in Bermuda, um, she goes from the snow white magical mirror to Bermuda through the Wingate, which is also a special portal um, that is supposed to uh, generate prosperity and other um, cultural uh, references. So um, it's 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 fun for me because I get a chance to do research um, within a community culturally as well as business wise. And um, I, I'm anticipating, knock on wood, or you know, not uh, that the Bermuda book is going to write itself. And then um, I have the exciting, you know, journey of sharing everyone's personal stories and the true stories of women of Bitcoin. And that's going to be um, interesting because just because of the diversity of the stories that everyone has experienced. So, yeah, it's actually amazing to me because when I started the podcast, I had this sense that there weren't that many women in this space. And then every day that goes by, I'm like, oh, there are tons. It's just nobody really hears from them. You've just got this very dominant group of voices, mostly male who, you know, are all on podcast the whole time. They're talking about everything the whole time. And I was just like, oh, there's a lot more women actually than I'd expected. So I'm, I've been really pleasantly surprised just, at, you know, how many women I've been able to connect with and, and just discovering the diversity of stuff that people are doing is incredible. Um, so, Andrew, yeah, it's, it's been really fun. Women are both in front of the scene as well as behind the scene. And that's uh, part of the reason why I wanted to write the Bitcoin Cinderella the True Stories of Women in Bitcoin, because I want to let um, not just girls, but any individual know that um, the power of dreaming, the that, and also that you don't always start in one path and you end up in another path. And so um, the life is all about possibilities. And I know I've been really blessed with the ability to manifest that um, hasn't always been easy. And there's been, you know, life struggles in terms of deciding, okay, I'm going to go out without that because I really want to do this. Um, but, you know, those are choices that you just have to decide, um, really, is this making you happy? Uh, because we have one go around and hopefully on that journey, um, you can also give back. And, and that's, um, part of the reason why as a lawyer, I'm really trying not to do anything that's a billable hour thing because it really bothers me. I would rather focus on the service and helping people. And that's why my my legal career has been very non-traditional because it just, I, I really want to just do things that resonate with me. Otherwise, I feel like it's a closed door. And if it's a closed door, we get dragged and screaming and it, it just doesn't work. <laughs> Um, what is it that you want to achieve at the end of this? Like, what's the North Star? Because you're kind of writing the kids' books, you're telling people stories, you're providing a resource and a wealth of information for people to use. Like, what's what's the end end goal here? So, um, I am, uh, you know, currently teaching, which I'll be retiring this year, um, so I can focus just on this. Um, there's so much. Uh, the Blockchain Legal Institute that I created is a centralized library of resources. So um, one of the, um, and it's really the umbrella for everything that I've been doing over the past eight years. So I really want to develop that to be, um, right now it's subscription-based, but my, my goal and hope is that it will end up being a public resource that will be um, underwritten by sponsors. So that way there can be an open source way to do this um, and provide education to um, a variety of communities that don't always have access to this education. And that's one reason why, as much as I love being in the classroom, I wanna step away from the school-based education so I can do um, more global education from the adult as well as youth. Um, because the, the kids have a vision that we sometimes lose as we get older and, um, they always keep us young. If we kind of feel their awe at the discovery of the moment when they learn something new, that aha moment is, you know, priceless. 
Um, so I guess the the North Star for me would definitely be um, the success of BLI within a variety of communities. The book is translated into multiple languages. Right now it's Spanish, Creole, soon to be French, possibly Swahili. Um, wow. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I definitely want to make sure that the educational materials um, are culturally appropriate and and um, uh, blockchain um, uh, rich with vocabulary. Um, I never want to simplify it so much that uh, people don't understand the tech side, but I definitely want to have them not be afraid of understanding what the vocabulary is because just like every profession, there's academic vocabulary, there's everything, you know, we all kind of have our lingo. And sometimes that scares people when they don't know what that means, because then they think, oh, it's, there's a wall. But really, it's all, it should be accessible to everyone. And if we are going to be in the big com community or the other communities, if we're going to make sure that everyone has, it's not bankless, and that we all have economic freedoms and are able to have you know, the, the roof over our heads, the food that we need, clean water, you know, the education, then we have to look at this globally. And um, it's this is not piecemeal in, in any, we're not piecemeal anytime soon, because you take a look at what happened with COVID. We all got shut down. We realized that, okay, we're in our home, our little box. But then we saw online the, the nature of community. We had people from different countries that we could see, you know, the, I just remember the, the people singing from one balcony to the other, the people, you know, having conversations, you know, with their neighbors, even though they couldn't be close, you know, um, people realized the power of communication and the importance of community. And, and I really want people to, we have a very fast paced life in our world. We need to learn how to slow down, appreciate each moment and uh, um, and be kind to ourselves. So, you know, again, uh, that's all part of the, I guess, the, the mantra of what I'm trying to both do for me and those around me, uh, sometimes successfully and sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> what do you teach at the moment? Are you just teaching a broad education spectrum or a specific uh, discipline? I I'm dual certified in general education and special education. And currently I'm in the special education field and I'm um, in charge of the, the department that I'm in for my school. And um, so at the moment, the grade that I've been assigned, even though uh, in elementary school, I've, I've taught from K through six, the grade that I've, I'm working with right now um, are kindergartners. So oh. I have... Uh, I know they're so cute and um, they're just so funny. You know, I, I, I think about each of the kids and um, the one of my kids keeps saying, well, why, what's this? Why, what's this? And so you answer and, you know, they're all about discovery. And, um, you know, uh, an, another little friend um, is definitely bilingual. And so, you know, I don't speak S Spanish, so I have to use my translator app to kind of help because he's in both languages he's learning and um you know but it's you it's 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 a, a fun fun time and i know i'll miss being in the classroom but i know i'll be able to kind of um create different classrooms yeah yeah that'd be incredible it's great that you have that experience in teaching um i wanted to ask you just to shift gears again if um what your thoughts are about women in this ecosystem because you obviously get a lot of exposure to women in this space, but do you have any thoughts as to why there aren't as many women as men and, and what's your thinking about how to address that, if, if we even need to address it? <laughs> um, I think we always need to address it. I think that um, we, I mean, that's why I wrote the Bitcoin Cinderella with strong women characters to model uh, for girls, the fact that they can be in tech they can be within a Bitcoin environment. They can be, you know, um, it's just one example. But um, I know that it's like anything else. You, If you don't see the women, you don't necessarily think that you can model after them. Um, so that's one challenge. And then I know I've been mentored by a lot of women and a lot of 
men, but we also need to, um, and we need to develop that give back system where um, we're always reaching, reaching behind to help educate the next person because it's, it, this definitely reminds me of me in elementary school because when I started my blockchain journey about eight years ago, I was at the kindergarten level. I might be at the sixth grade level now, but those that are actually doing the tech, creating the blockchain, you know, the really deep dive in coding, that to me is like graduate school because I haven't done a hackathon like that yet. So I, you know, for me to look at all the code, you know, even, you know, when in my Bitcoin wallet, I'm looking at all these little numbers thinking, okay, that's a hash. Well, how does that work? That's why I bought a note because I really wanted to see more of the tech and have hands on. But, and I've had a lot of um, individuals help me with that. So I think we need to have more educational programs to expose. Sorry about that. And I think that from the educational perspective, we just need to have more um, books, more webinars um, in multiple languages. So, um, you know, I think that's the biggest challenge. And... I know that there was some conversation on LinkedIn about women at, at conferences, that there might not be enough women uh, to be speakers. There are enough women to be speakers. We also have to encourage women to not be afraid to take the stand and to, um, cause it's, I remember when I first got my law degree, I did not want to go in the courtroom because I was nervous to stand up and, and, um, and to talk. And now, you know, many years later, I keep thinking, okay, I understand that that mindset for that time frame, but now I would have no problems getting in front of a judge and arguing a case. But it takes different time period of your life sometimes. So I think mm. we need to, I think we need to encourage women to um, to speak, even if they are on multiple panels, so that way they're not the primary source because it is hard to speak, but they need to be, their voices need to be heard. Um, so that's why I'm glad you started what you did, because you're giving access to women of a lot of different communities a voice. And I think that's really important. Yeah, and I kind of, with the member platform, I wanted to connect women together as well, because I felt that many of them, they're on Twitter, but they don't really like using it and they don't tend to speak much on Twitter. So I wanted to create more of a closed community where they could actually interact with each other without having you know, uh, the sort of external broader world being present um, and just create content that was more specific to women that, that they would jive with a bit more. But it's been really fascinating for me doing the podcast and talking to all these women because I suddenly just discovered that they're everywhere, like they're everywhere and they're working on lots of interesting projects. And, you know, a lot of them I consider friends now, you know, we've been talking back and forth for months and working on stuff together and they're mentors to me and advisors and all of that kind of stuff. So, it really has struck me how rich and, and diverse the community is and how much stuff is going on. But I do think, to your point about the conferences, is that men tend to put themselves forward for these things and women don't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and so I encourage the women on my platform, I'm like this conference is coming up. If you're not already speaking, apply to be a speaker, like make sure that you put yourself forward for this and so on. Because I just think that, that that's that's how we get, you know, more, more kind of uh, interest and more traction. So... Yeah, I would encourage to note to any woman listening to this right now is <laughs> um, apply to be a speaker at, at conferences because you never know and you probably have something really great to contribute. I have a friend actually who's a yoga teacher and a Bitcoiner and she did on the platform, she did for us a Bitcoin yoga session. And you kind of, her name is Alison Yancey. She's the founder of Optimal Wellness. So she's very deep into the whole wellness space. She runs retreats and is into all of this kind of health stuff. But I was really curious as to like how this might pan out, like what's a Bitcoin yoga session, but she basically spent some time doing meditative work with us and breathing and then talking about how a lot of the principles of yoga tie in with a lot of the principles of Bitcoin, like the self-sovereignty, the non-violence, like all of that kind of stuff. And it was fascinating. And then she very kindly wrote a guest post for my, my uh, blog, um, it, you know, kind of reiterating that stuff in written form. And it never occurred to me. I mean, I'm a trained yoga teacher. I did the British Wheel of Yoga training and the Yoga Alliance training. And I ta taught yoga for about seven years. Never once in my Bitcoin journey did it occur to me 
that like Bitcoin and yoga were related. And so I was like, wow, you know, how much well, other stuff am I missing? <laughs> too, because again, um, I guess the word that pops into my mind is the imposter syndrome. A lot of times we don't realize the knowledge that we have and we don't give ourselves the credit for the learning that we've done and the fact that someone else might not have the same learning. So um, when I started to write the books, I realized, wow, I, over the past few years, I really have been a sponge. I have, you know, taken in a lot of information, even though there's always more to know. Um, but someone who's new, like the, the woman who came up to me at the Bitcoin conference in May of 2023, she was just starting her journey. So everything was brand new to her. She was like, you know, a kindergarten child saying, wow. And that's how I felt when I went to my first Bitcoin conference. I had bought Bitcoin. This is, I guess, prior to me becoming a Bitcoin miner, or maybe I had already become a Bitcoin miner, but I hadn't gone to a conference. I walked the aisles and I saw in the exhibit hall, all the businesses. And I thought, wow, this is huge. This is not what I thought. I always thought you just kind of, you know, put it on a centralized exchange or whatever, you know, I knew about the process. But, you know, you finally realize the the community of it, it's a lot bigger. And when, when we start our own personal journey and we start educating ourselves, um, someone else is always behind us. They're always starting their journey first, you know, so... Um, and and it's it is really important to realize that when you as a as a as a woman who's going on stage speaking, you will be inspiring someone else who might not have that same knowledge base, um, because your journey is a little bit farther along, or maybe not. There might be really exper experienced other women in the audience who are listening to you, but there might be a nugget that you're sharing that is their aha moment of something else. So um, I guess the reason why I'm saying this is never be afraid to take the stage, never be afraid of what you might say or not say, never be afraid of making a mistake in what you say, because that happens all the time. That's why we have the edit button. <laughs> but also, um, there's nothing that you can say that's going to be so detrimental. So just um, uh, be yourself, be authentic, um, trust yourself and, and, and share your light, basically. Yeah, it's true, actually. In some ways, I think if people are sort of reticent to share their story, and I'm not saying they have to, but if they're reticent to, in a way, you're kind of keeping something that you could actually benefit somebody else with, like that that path that you've trodden or that knowledge that you've gained. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, uh, again, we'll just say it again in case anyone missed it. If you're a woman in this space, like, please put yourself forward to join panels and speak at events because we'd love to hear from you and we'd love to hear, you know, what you're doing. Um, so what's next then? So you're working on like the Bitcoin Cinderella, you're working on the true stories of the women in Bitcoin. Um, you've obviously got your hands full with your day job and your blockchain legal institute. But is there anything else on the horizon that you're planning on doing that you can share or, or what are your next steps? Yeah, so I'm I'm actually doing some really exciting legal research. Um, I am uh, I've already kind of outlined it, so I'm going to start next week actually making calls. But I'm I'm researching what's going on within our 50 state court system, um, and the the types of resources that they're using to educate the judges because I want to find out if there are gaps on um, what they need to know, um, not just by what the plaintiffs or defendants share, but, you know, where do they go to find out background? Um, and not just from the cases that have been decided, but to understand the content, to understand the protocols, to understand what the community is, who the community is in the application, that type of thing. Because I think when, yes, the decisions of a case is based upon the facts of the case, but when you are deciding and looking at the facts of the case, you can't necessarily, you do do it in isolation because that is one case, but you also do it with the understanding of what is the community. So I think it's important if the judges within the United States are not fully aware that, and I'm just not talking about being educated through media, then they, they need to have some background knowledge. And, um, you know, so... Uh, that, so that's research is going to be conducted and, and at least 
phase one of it, because I know as we kind of do the research, it'd probably be like an onion that, went, that we're going to unpeel and different phases will happen. But I'm really hoping to release the first part by September. Um, and we are also doing, um, I really want to start, and I so so we are, the educational portal. So for continuing legal education, continuing education, and I'm not going to be the only talking head, so to speak. There are other individuals. Oh, I see. So if lawyers in this space want to kind of upskill, they've got somewhere where they can go for further training. That's fantastic. What a great idea. Yeah, exactly. And so there are other um, attorneys or experts in the content area who might not be attorneys that um, can provide workshops so that way the continuing legal education for these attorneys can happen and they can get credit for their bar associations and that type of thing. So um, so that's definitely things that we're doing this year, um, which is uh, rewarding to me because I do want to step into the adult education side. Yeah, that's fantastic. Wow. What great work you're doing. I don't know how you find the time. I should probably ask you, like, how do you manage your time? <laughs> <laughs> um i use google calendar religiously um i have a system where i have um different tasks that i organize by priority one two three or four and that way i can move it if i get it done from one day to the next i'm also a constant list writer paper wise and my wall in my offices has a ton of lists for different projects. Um, but I I use it strategically so that way I um I'm able to kind of collectively manage the time. And I also I do verticals in my head in terms of you know, the different projects have different verticals. And then within those projects, there's certain priorities and certain calendar timelines. But I also don't stress if I don't meet them because I know that there's going to be something that happens during the day that's just going to throw off the entire schedule. And, you know, again, so be it, you know, it's just, it's, it's sometimes things are out of your control. Um, you know, like when my battery in my car died, well, that took up three hours. <laughs> so, but, you know, again, um, the, uh, I'm lucky that I have the flexibility to do this. I know some individuals might not because of family obligations or whatever. My daughter is, you know, as I said, an adult now, so I have that luxury. But um, yeah, so time management, um, sometimes it overwhelms me, but then I just kind of rethink, okay, reset, rethink and plan and then just do bite sizes. So, um, you know, again, it's, I know what I want to accomplish and it ends up always getting done. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> Eventually, exactly. It's funny. I do notice that. I feel like people who've had kids are a lot more chill about stuff and deadlines and things like that because they're just, they're so experienced at handling um, the unexpected, shall we say. <laughs> you have to. And I think as a teacher, you see that too, because you don't, you know, you have your curriculum, you have to teach. But sometimes there is a group of kids that just need extra time to teach it. And you can't be rigid with the child because the child is a, a precious little being that needs to know this information. So, yes, there is always a collective organic system that you work within. But then there is being human and understanding. How do you navigate your humanity? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very true. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Jackie. This has been so interesting. I am uber impressed by everything that you've managed to achieve and just the tenacity of learning this stuff and then being able to regurgitate it in a, in a form that other people can understand. So thank you for all the amazing work. Thank you for existing and much luck with, with all of this. I hope it goes really well. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how all these different projects turn out. So thank you. And I appreciate being on. I appreciate, um, you know, everyone who's in your community. And um, I think it's phenomenal, the the safe space that you've created. So that way everyone can learn and blossom like a flower, you know. So again, we all need that uh, because it's um, it, it takes everyone to help each other. Yeah, for sure. Well, thanks so much, Jackie. Have a, enjoy the rest of your day. And, uh, thank you.